Good afternoon. <laughs> welcome. I'm Tom Krauss. I'm the chair of the Ojai Chautauqua, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. We're really uh, glad that you are here. I have brief comments to make, and then I'll introduce our moderator. So our objective in putting on these uh, Chautauqua events is to give you the best information that we can about important and controversial issues. Uh, our method for doing that is to get a group of people together who are knowledgeable and ask them to have a friendly, uh, collegial uh, discussion, something that uh, we might not see a lot of these days. Um, but we think that's the best way to help you understand the issue. So we're not uh, trying to convince you of any particular position. Uh, we're not a political action uh, group of any kind. Uh, rather, our objective is to simply inform you about these interesting and complex and controversial uh, issues. Um, our moderator today is Dan Schnur. Um, Dan uh, teaches at USC and at UC Berkeley and writes a column for the San Francisco Chronicle. He has uh, been with us many times before. We're delighted to have him back. Please welcome Dan Schnur. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and thanks very much to all of you for joining us uh, for our first Chautauqua of the spring season. Um, like Tom, I'm thrilled that so many of you can be here with us today. And before I want to introduce the panel, I just want to offer a couple, a few thank yous. Um, first of all, uh, to Tom and his wife, Catherine, and to our good friends, Esther and Tom Wattell, for the tremendous work and the tremendous leadership they've shown in putting this series together for us. Thank you all very, very much. I'm also very grateful to the entire host committee that uh, Tom and Esther and Tom and Catherine have put together. Um, all of you have been tremendous supporters of this. We couldn't do this without you. We're very, very grateful to you for your support and your involvement. Um, I also want to thank um, our good friend, uh, Andy Gilman. Andy, of course, has worked tirelessly to put these programs together, and we're extremely grateful to him as well. Uh, these things wouldn't take place without him. Andy, thank you so much for all your work. And although she gets mad when I do it, I also want to thank my wife and program partner, Cecile A. Black, because Believe me, even though while I stand up here for most of the afternoon and hog the spotlight and hide the hog the microphone, she's the one who makes this all happen as well. And so, Cecile, thank you very much for everything you do. So the first time I had the privilege of participating in, in a Chautauqua was about three years ago, and I came as a panelist, and I had an extraordinary experience. Not just because the Chautauqua takes place in Ojai, although that certainly didn't hurt, but because, as Tom was alluding to a moment ago, in this hyper-partisan, hyper-polarized political environment in which we all live, the fact that smart and well-meaning, engaged women and men could come together to talk about issues that were important to them, issues on which they might disagree, but issues on which they could disagree respectfully. And as Tom said, instead of screaming and shouting, engage in productive conversation. It was such a respite for me, and it was such an honor for me, that when, they, when the host committee asked Cecile and I to come back and help you put together the series, we were just thrilled. Not just because we wanted to contribute to the conversations as they take place here in the greater Ojai community, because as many of you know, we believe that this model is one that can and should be duplicated. This is the kind of thing that can and should be taking place across California and across the country. And as we continue to hold these Chautauqua here in Ojai, we believe that you can set an example for similarly intelligent, similarly engaged people across the state and across the country. And the fact that you're all here as part of the first step toward reclaiming our political process from what, from what it's become is something really extraordinary. So before we begin, begin, in addition to all the other thank yous that you've just offered, give yourselves a round of applause, because frankly, you deserve it. So 
So like last fall, uh, when we had a lot of fun and learned a lot with our two program discussions, uh, we put together, I believe, uh, and I think you'll agree with me shortly, a tremendous panel for today's discussion. And I'm going to take just a minute to introduce our panelists, and then we'll dive right into the questions. Um, I'll ask questions, um, and we'll have a conversation for about the first hour or so of the program. And in about 30, 40 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, we'll begin uh, uh, to collect the cards that you have. The cards are on their, are on their chairs. Is that correct, Andy? Yes. OK, good. Uh, you'll, you'll have cards on your chair. And in about 30, 40 minutes, we'll begin to collect them. And then the last portion of the program, instead of me monopolizing with all of my questions, I'll simply, uh, I'll simply be asking the questions that you provide. So in addition to listening to our panelists, and no doubt learning from them and enjoying what they have to say, think about the questions you want me to put to them in the second half of today's discussion, and we'll make sure we'll do everything we can to ask as many of those questions as possible. Um, I understand that in addition to the rest of the uh, attendees today, that we also have people in the audience uh, from Oak Grove School and from Villanova School, is that correct? Do we have uh, students from Oak Grove and Villanova? I would say this, I don't know about the rest of the old people in the audience, but when I was 15 or 16 or 17, if somebody had asked me to spend a Saturday afternoon listening to a conversation like this, I would have run in the other direction. So let's give these impressive young people a round of applause that they deserve. In the past, we've had uh, students here from Nordoff School as well. What I understand is today is Nordoff's prom. So let's give them a flyer on this one, and we'll have them back in a, we'll have them back in a month. Uh, but for the high school students in the audience today, I've got two requests for you. Number one, we really do want you to ask questions. So make sure you fill out a card with questions of your own. And, and what, the other thing we'd like you to do is put your name and your school on that card so that we can recognize a really impressive and really smart young person, and so we can make sure that you get extra credit in your social studies class. <laughs> so we're looking for questions from as many of you as possible, but from the young people in particular, put your name and your school on those cards so that we have a chance to, to call you out. All right, so let's get started. And we're gonna, I, I wanna uh, introduce our panel, and then we'll get right, and then we'll get right into the questions. Um, first of all, uh, sitting to my Far, 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 far left. Hi, <laughs> Johanna. <laughs> Way down at the other end of the table is my friend Johanna Masca. And Johanna is really extraordinary. She worked, uh, she worked in a senior media position in the Obama White House for several years. She's now moved out here to California and is the CEO uh, for a uh, communications firm called Global Situations. Johanna, thank you so much for joining us. Um, sitting next to Johanna is my friend, is our friend Mike Madrid. Uh, Mike is the co-CEO of a firm here in California called Grassroots Lab, and they run political campaigns and in particular do data analysis. Um, we have Johanna, a Democrat on the panel. We have Mike, a Republican. And one thing in particular that we're going to want to talk to Mike a little bit about later is in addition to the work that he's done in Republican politics over the years, he spent uh, a great deal of time examining the Latino and the Latina vote here in California, so we'll come back to that later. Mike, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> so both of our partisans, of course, are here today not as advocates for one side or the other, but as really smart and perceptive analysts, because they are, and we're really thrilled to have them both. In addition to Johanna and to Mike, though, we've got three really, really impressive, very well-respected journalists, and I'm gonna introduce them very quickly. Uh, sitting next to Mike is our friend Seema Mehta. Seema is the chief political reporter for the Los Angeles Times. She has covered far more presidential campaigns for the Times than you would ever guess from looking at her. But she is one of the most respected political journalists in the country, and we're thrilled to have her with us here today. So I think so much um, like Seema, C.J. Jackson is a print journalist, one of the best in the business. C.J. is the West Coast bureau chief for the Politico website. And I'm guessing that most of you are familiar with Politico. If you are not, it is the single best place to go every morning and throughout the day for an accumulation of breaking political and government news. 
and to a large degree, that's because of the good work that CJ does. CJ, thank you so much for joining us. And finally, last but certainly not, not least, is our friend Claudia Cowan. And I knew Claudia back when she was a local television reporter, and she, she, since she's gone on to much bigger and better and greater things, she currently is the chief Northern California Bay Area correspondent for the Fox News Channel. Claude, just like CJ and Seema, are two of the most respected print journalists in the country. Claudia Easley is one of the most respected broadcast journalists. We're thrilled to have her with us also, Claudia. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and so before, uh, before I ask the first question of our panelists, I'm going to ask a question of all of you. And I'd ask you that you hold off on answering it. You can, sit, can consider your answer over the duration of the program. Two of our panelists here today, and those of you who were at the dinner last night are not allowed to answer this. <laughs> Two of our panelists here today are married to each other. <laughs> and so we'd ask you over the course of the next hour and 30, hour and 45 minutes <laughs> to see if you can figure out which two are, uh, are, are, part of the same, are part of the same marriage. We'll take a vote at the end and see how close they get to getting. <laughs> okay. All right. So the first question, um, I, I want to give credit where credit's due because it's not my question, it's Tom Krause's question. And he asked the question of us last night at a smaller get-together, sort of a batting practice for today's real game. And he, he framed, I thought, a tremendous question. And I'm just going to steal it shamelessly from you, Tom, if that's okay. Um, the question he asked me last night um, which are gonna put, I'm going to put to our panel in slightly different ways, and I'm going to start with you, CJ, is even before we get to the first 107 days of the Trump presidency, we want to start on a broader perspective. And before we talk about the level of successes or not that Mr. Trump has achieved over these 107 days, more broadly, CJ, uh, putting Trump aside for a second, how should we, how should we judge the success of a president, whether Trump or Obama or any other? Sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. I, I think I speak for all of the panelists when I say it's a, a unique honor to escape our kind of normal day-to-day -day grinds and come up to Ojai and talk about issues that I think we all really care about. So I'm grateful for that opportunity. Um, when I think about uh, a president, and I've covered three now, so I'm dating myself a little bit. That's my modern era, as we discuss. Um, I think that... Uh, I look at a couple of different factors. One is um, how they're growing into the job, uh, whether they're assuming sort of the trappings of the presidency that can be kind of all-consuming and are you know the sort of thing that you don't really understand fully until you've taken the office. Um, number two, I think you have to look at some basic metrics, and I think that when we talk about President Trump, this can be kind of a difficult thing because he's a metric-defying guy in a lot of ways. But you have to look at um, whether they've gotten uh, what they wanted to accomplish done or what they thought were their early goals of their presidency done in the first, um, in the first part of their presidency. And then the final uh, way that um, you know, I look at a president and try to evaluate sort of whether they're being successful is, is in part their own self-perception of it. Because when we talk about the first hundred days, we're talking about um, ultimately a very impactful time, but a very, you know, in the sweep of a presidency, a very short period of time. Um, and so whether President Trump or President Obama or President Bush was co is comfortable with the role and, you know, comfortable with the way they're leading the job uh, is a very, um, it's a good indicator of, uh, of you know, where they're headed. Um, if they, uh, you know, President Trump um, has riled people up in different ways on both sides of the spectrum, but I think that he feels uh, very good about how he's been as president, at least that is what he's communicated to us. And so um, to me, you have to uh, look at that and say, well, um, you know, judging by his own, own self-analysis, he feels very comfortable. On the legislative side of things, um, every other president I've covered had more done by this point than President Trump does. Um, but uh, President Trump has utilized executive orders in a way that uh, neither of his two immediate predecessors did, and he's accomplished some things that way. Um, and then in terms of growing into the office, uh, you know, President Trump has already shown that tactically he's able to adapt to the office. He has, um, he has changed his style in terms of um, working with Congress and um, kind of the way he 
uh, navigates the office on the fly. Uh, and sometimes that can transmit uh, as chaos, but it also shows a guy who is working through his process, I think. Great. CJ, thank you very much. I want to I want to turn to Mike now. Um, and Mike, as we talked about earlier, um, runs an extraordinarily well-regarded and successful data analysis firm. So let's let's talk about making these judgments, you know, from a, from a data perspective. And, and, and Mike, I'll ask the, you the question in the following way. On one hand, the 100 days polls that most of the national news media came out with showed that Trump is the least popular yeah. new president in modern American history. Um, on the flip side, he 98% of those men and women who voted for him in November have said that they would vote for him again today if the election were to be held again, which is a historically unprecedented number also. So talk a little bit statistically and then if you will more broadly about how you come to these kind of assessments. So that's a great question and I think CJ did a really good job of kind of encapsulating how we, how we should be looking at the success of a president. When you're looking at it from a data perspective and from a strategist perspective, um, what Dan just uh, characterized is, uh, while it's a, a unique phenomenon at this moment, we have seen this kind of data gelling in this direction over at least the last few presidential administrations, and my uh, strong suspicion is that we're going to see that continue, at least for the foreseeable future. And by that I mean um, presidential candidates have a much tighter range between their floors of support and their ceilings of support. I don't think Donald Trump has really ever pulled higher or much higher than he currently is, which is not very high. And I don't believe that he's got much of a ceiling to go up above beyond that. He certainly never, never demonstrated that. His administration is not um, handling itself in a way that would suggest he's trying to expand that base. But as Dan accurately pointed out, that floor is very intense. And my strong suspicion is that if general trends continue, that that will maintain currently as well. Um, all of which speaks to a different way, I believe, of governing, um, which is, will be um, a marked departure from the way we have seen, at least in the historical context, presidents operate in the past. I think in the recent future, the last two presidents specifically, you've seen uh, this departure really manifest itself where the need to play to the base is more important than it is to expand the numbers and try to reach a higher ceiling, a higher threshold. And we can get into, and I hope we do, a, a lot of why that is and how we got to this point. Um, it, it, I think it, it, it is, um, I, I hate to use the term a troubling dynamic, it certainly feels very troubling, but I think it's a function of the way um, society is just segmenting right now, and it's a reality that we're going to have to deal with. So I'm not too sure if that answered your question from the data perspective, but that's, that's what we're looking at. It certainly does, and I want to come back to your other point a little bit later once we've had the other panelists, uh, given the other panelists an opportunity to weigh in. But before we move on, I really do want to underscore that point, that last point that Mike makes, because it's a particularly important one, and it is one that we want to come back to uh, a little bit later. Um, Donald Trump, from Election Day until now, has not expanded his base of support. And you can make an argument, as Mike alluded to, that to a large degree it's because he hasn't tried to. Most presidents elect after an election, and in their first weeks, months, even years in office, make a great effort to expand their base of support between, from those people who voted for them to those who, uh, a number of those who did not. And Trump has come to the conclusion, and we will talk a little bit later, about both the pros and cons of this approach, that rather than trying to expand his base of support, the president has said, I'm going to instead concentrate simply on motivating my existing base of support to the greatest degree possible. And I am more likely to govern successfully, he believes, by having a smaller but more impassioned group of supporters than making an effort to broaden that base. Fascinating point, Mike, and I definitely want to come back to it. Before we do, though, I really want to come to Johanna and give her a chance to offer what I think is a particularly valuable perspective. Neither Mike nor Johanna, as I mentioned here earlier, are here as partisans. They're not here as advocates for one side or the other. But one of the many reasons we're very fortunate to have Johanna here is, of course, she has the very unique perspective of having worked in a White House at a time when an outsider president was just taking office and getting used to those challenges. So from that perspective, Johanna, 
how should we be making these kind of assessments? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thank you to everyone for having us and for coming out on this uh, beautiful rainy day. Um, I think that's, you know, it is interesting because I remember not even just our first 100 days, but our first, I think it was five days, um, we <laughs> had gotten into the, the White House and I was telling these guys earlier, um, there was there were a couple incidents where you're just learning it's a there's a learning curve of getting into a White House and so uh, we all got our offices and our badges and you get you know these keys to go into the White House but you don't know how everything works and I remember uh, it, there were two incidents so um, one of our un, I, I won't name uh, press aides or press uh, officials was trying to open the door of the press briefing room so hard that it started smoking and everyone's like oh you have to you know pull should we pull the fire alarm and they're like do not pull the fire alarm and <laughs> in the White House you don't want to pull the fire alarm but then you know it was right after that um, I believe it was Peter Orzag who uh, had gotten his very nice office in the EEOB and it had a fireplace so he um, went to go light a fire and it, you're not supposed to do that so the fire alarm did go off and, and I remember standing right in front of Pebble Beach which is uh, right in front of the White House thinking oh my god all the press are just going to be talking about how we're burning the place down <laughs> and, uh, so you know to the degree that I have sympathy for a learning curve uh, I have I have been there. Um, you know, I, I obviously did not uh, support um, President Trump's uh, bid for office. I'm a Democrat. I supported President Obama. But I actually was sitting back during the campaign and I was saying, you know, he's a master marketer and a communicator. And in the sense that anyone can attribute whatever they want to make America great again, um, he had a lot of um, he got a lot of people to support what um, he was doing, um, and he did. He showed us, he told us exactly what to expect in the sense of um, there was a 100-day <coughs> plan that I um, often get frustrated because it wasn't really covered in October, but rather the day after he was elected, but there was a 100-day plan of what he he projected that he was going to do. Now, what I say is um, often I think he's moved some of the goalposts to meet his marketing needs, which is he said he's going to drain the swamp, which means congressional term limits. And at first, as someone who got frustrated because Congress wouldn't compromise with us on anything, I thought, hey, term limits, that could be interesting. And uh, term limits seem to have all together disappeared. And now drain the swamp is just, uh, you know, we're going to put um, a freeze on federal workers. And then, you know, oh, actually, because of the unintended consequences, we're not going to put a freeze on federal workers. But we will check it off the list. So I am interested in this first 100 days, um, analyzing it from a perspective. I am sympathetic, and I will never root against a United States of America, the president of the United States of America. Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely interested to hear this analysis as we go uh, throughout this um, interesting presidency. Well, Johanna, thank you very much. And I think particularly the point of expectations is an important one. And I want to get back to that in just a moment, too. But before we do, I'd like to do for a moment is sort of reverse the telescope. And instead of looking at the White House, look instead at the voters. And Claudia Cowan, you occupy what I think might be the most fascinating job in journalism, covering the very deep blue Bay Area for the Fox News Channel. And so you spend a great deal of time covering not the president, but rather covering the voters who are responding to the president. Right. And so I, talk I, a little bit about how they're assessing the first 107 days of his presidency. Well, um, I uh, don't really cover the pulse of the American voter. Um, I cover the pulse of the American opposition uh, to the president. And it's been interesting. Um, there's always a story. If it's a day that ends in Y, there's going to be a protest. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen so many protests as we have had almost every day in the Bay Area, whether it's the March for Science or the Women's March or the Tax Day March, but obviously mostly marches uh, for or against free speech, uh, depending on what side you're coming at it. Uh, the, the response in the Bay Area has been this overwhelming sense of depression. 
uh, you, you, you kind of almost have to go off Facebook because people are crying every day on Facebook about the election results. Um, I, I don't think anybody in the Bay Area saw it coming. They just couldn't conceive that Donald Trump would win this election, but he did. And now they're in uh, the second or third stage of grief. Uh, they're still in anger or denial, and I don't know that we're going to be getting to acceptance anytime soon up there. <laughs> but it is bringing out uh, voices um, and protesters. Uh, and it's been I interesting to cover. Uh, for me, it's provided a lot of opportunities to uh, be in the middle of a protest, uh, whether it's at Berkeley or in San Francisco. Uh, and, and you see uh, just how they're there's this effort among some to stifle and muffle uh, the speech of others. And in sometimes with uh, university administration officials kind of looking the other way, but I think that's getting better. Uh, so it's been an interesting uh, 100 days for me as a reporter to cover the response in the very blue Bay Area who is very much uh, opposed to Trump. Well, I, listen, I, I listen to Claudia talking about the Bay Area's response to Trump and I think somewhere there's a reporter in Dallas who's just as good, okay, maybe not quite as good, is Claudia, who's thinking, I think I had to do this eight years ago. <laughs> so if, uh, if 50 is the new 30, and orange is the new black, maybe California is the new Texas. And so <laughs> when, we, uh, when we switch partisan sides, we switch the reactions also. Seema, I wanna come to you, and in particular, I'd like to, we'd love to get your broader perspective on how a president's success is measured. But in particular, I'd like to build off of a really smart point that Johanna made a minute or two ago. Um, in terms of expectations, now, no president, Republican or Democrat, accomplishes everything they set out to do and end up compromising their agenda either quickly or uh, over a longer period of time. But talk for a little bit, if you can, about the differences and or the similarities between candidate Trump and President sure. Trump. Well, I think for voters, you know, in talking to voters on the campaign trail, whether they supported him or opposed him, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, a number of them had real questions about what he would do because he was, he's sort of been a chameleon over his life. He's held many different positions. He was pro-choice at one point. He's pro-life now, et cetera. He was a Democrat at one point. He's a Republican now, obviously. Um, so I think there was, and he doesn't have a, a record in elected office as every other president, you know, practically, you know, for the past, what, half century or more has. So there was no record to study, you know, to say he's voted this way in the past. He supported this tax plan in the past. So, you know, so there was no way to say, well, we know sort of where he'll go going forward. So, you know, he was making tons of like bold, you know, pronouncements on the campaign trail. But there was a question of, you know, is he going to follow through with this once he gets to the White House? Or is he more of a Rockefeller Republican? Is he more of a New York Republican? Is he more squishy? Um, so I think there were some real doubts about whether he would. I, mean, I think as we've seen over the first 100 days, you know, whether you love him, whether you hate him, he has certainly pursued every single thing he's talked about, whether it's building the wall, you know, trying to do the travel ban. He hasn't been successful at it, um, except you know, with a couple exceptions. But he has certainly pursued, you know, especially like the, the big controversial you know, promises that he made on the campaign trail. And in talking to his voters, I think one of the reasons that that number that we talked about earlier, that 98% would still vote for him, uh, that number is so high is because they really believe that he's trying to do these things and he's been stymied by Democrats or he's been stymied by the courts. I think um, if this continues for the next four years, I think that it, it's a different question for voters than if he really has not been able to fulfill some of these promises. But the, and the other thing I think is, is interesting is for um, Republicans who were skeptical of him but who voted for him because they, they didn't want to vote for Hillary, or who voted for him because they felt the duty to party they should vote for him, or they voted for him you know, because of Mike Pence. In talking to them, or, they didn't, or Republicans who didn't vote for him, who just couldn't vote for him, um, in talking to them, the one thing they found great hope in is, his, is the Supreme Court uh, confirmation of Gorsuch. And that has, it, it's, it comes up so often in conversation that even if I don't like what this guy is doing, even if I don't like the, the message that he's putting on my party, um, this is something that will affect the court for generations in a way that I approve of, and he might get the opportunity to do that, you know, three or more, you know, three more times in this first term. Right. Seema, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to stick with you and change the direction of the conversation a little bit because I think one of the really benefits I think we learned last fall that we got from our panelists for those who worked in the media is hearing not just about what they not only hearing just about what they'd covered, but how they'd covered it. How does a journalist? Uh, cover an election or a presidency like this one. So Seema, I'm gonna stick with you and ask you, either from the first 107 days of the Trump presidency or from the campaign that preceded it, mm -hmm. what was your favorite story? What was your best story? What was your most <laughs> interesting story? Um, I don't know, this campaign, this campaign and this presidency is just unlike anything 
I think any of us have ever covered before because it's you know in the past Republican or Democrat there's usually a sort of set of rules that you follow like a, a way that you know you have communications with the press so it's just been so different um, and to have you know for example the president on Twitter like this hasn't happened before usually you, you have a message of the day and your spokesperson del delivers the message <laughs> of the day you don't have a president you know waking up and watching Fox and Friends and you know commenting on Twitter or, or you know making foreign policy on Twitter so that's just been remarkable to watch I think one of my favorite stories or one of the more interesting stories for me was um, Donald Trump going to the Iowa State Fair in uh, the summer of 2015. And you know, this is after he'd announced, and we, nobody still knew what to make of him, and I think a lot of us, myself included, were underestimating him. You know, we thought he was you know, just doing this for ratings, or you know, doing, you know, we, we thought he was playing around, we didn't know how serious he was, we didn't even know if he would continue until, you know, until the Iowa caucuses. And so he shows up at the Iowa State Fair with his helicopter, and he's giving kids rides on the helicopter, and then he goes to the, the fair, and the fair is, I mean, this is like a state country fair where there's like deep fried Snickers and um, pork tenderloins and just uh, everything is deep fried. And there's like, you know, there's all kinds of animals and like there's like manure like on pathways because you know, they leave the animals various places. And so he's got these like white shoes on and he's got this like sort of like the hat the skipper wore on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> and he's walking down like one of the main like thoroughfares of the state fair and this crowd is surrounding him and it's you know and he's getting like manure and his like little white shoes and people are like just like you know like oh I touched him I touched his shoulder and it was just I mean it was the jostling and the frenzy it was like the way you know I, I remember once seeing Kobe Bryant at uh, South Coast Plaza and this enormous crowd just you know surrounded him as he as he walked around um, seeing people's excitement at just seeing him or just you know getting a glimpse of him or, or touching his shoulder that was the first experience that that showed me that he had this tangible connection with people that so few politicians have. Um, and that was the first, that was like sort of like a wake-up call for me, like, it, like this is something different here. So let, let the record show that 107 days into the Trump presidency, this is the first Donald Trump-Kobe Bryant comparison that we've heard. <laughs> and if it picks up going forward, Seema will know, will, will, will know where it started. But I want to ask you a follow-up question before I go to the other reporters here. You talked about Trump on Twitter, and I think this is really, really interesting. Now, Barack Obama, as Johanna can tell us, uh, pioneered the use of social media in all sorts of unprecedented ways. Um, Ronald Reagan and uh, Bill Clinton, the use of cable television. John F. Kennedy, his use of, of TV. Franklin Roosevelt, his, his use of radio. Talk a little bit about Trump and the next advancement in, in terms of political communications. Well, I think there's just, like, what's different about this is when you talk about any of these prior presidents, there was a strategy. There were people who decided this is the message of the day. And even if they were putting it out in a different form, there was a plan. Um, people made a joke, and Mitt Romney's campaign in 2012, there was some line that came out afterwards about how like 12 people or 17 people had to approve every tweet. And people joked about that. But it's so the opposite of what's happening now, because I think in none of these cases did you have a president who is speaking directly to people, just what's on his mind, like what he might bring up at you know, breakfast with his wife. Like there was, there was no filter, and it's, it's just really interesting to me because you know, like markets move on what presidents say. Every single word matters, and that's why I just think it's so unprecedented to have such a direct, unfiltered flow of communication from a president to the world. CJ, well, I was just going to add to that. I think every president you and I have, or presidential candidate you and I have covered has obsessed with a, obs like, you know, circumnavigating the media filter with their communications. And it's, uh, it's funny to me because um, President Trump is the most unconventional politician I've ever covered, and he has by far and away been the most successful at, you know, taking me and Seema out of the process right. when it comes to getting his message out. Um, you know, I, I don't know what Seema's Twitter following is. Mine's hovering around 5,000, and if I tweet something, uh, no one's going to retweet it. Um, <laughs> well, they might, but they, you know. Um, whereas, you know, pr President Trump can add an exclamation point, and that thing is going to fire itself all around the world and back before I even read it. Um, and I find that to be, um, in terms of his communications, it's, it's really revealing about what he wants, which is basically no one between him and the people. Um, and the fact that Twitter is, is his preferred medium for delivering some of these messages um, means I think that he has a pretty sophisticated understanding about communication in, in our kind of current moment in America. And it's very different than the way um, 
Also, his desire to communicate is very different than other president and presidential candidates I've covered. I don't think that um, President Obama uh, really always wanted to communicate as frequently and, and you know, kind of like moment to moment with the American people the way President Trump does. He has a, that's very kind of a, a part of his personality, his desire to um, tell you what's going on. You know. Well, and, and I think you're really f framing an important concept here. Um, because if you look back at Donald Trump's biography, not in business or on reality TV, but as a media presence in a very hyper-competitive New York City media market, page six and New York one and the tabloids and that sort of thing, the lesson he seems to have learned is it doesn't matter if it's positive attention or negative attention, it's easier to translate unfavorable coverage into favorable or it's more beneficial to co translate unfavorable coverage into favorable than to simply not be noticed at all. Um, since we're with you, CJ, I'll stick with you for another minute. What's your story? First 107 days are from the campaign. What's, your, what's, what's the favorite story you've covered? Well, so I, I don't know that I can boil it down to one specific example, but a thing that I have found that I think is fascinating to me with this campaign uh, is um, the extent to which people who I would not associate with deep feelings about politics um, or a deep interest in electoral politics, the extent to which Donald Trump has, um, you know, kind of uh, taken his car, parked it in the proverbial garage of their heads and, and occupied space. I have aunts and uncles who um, are, you know, political atheists or just not interested, um, roommates from college, and they will text me at all hours of the night and just, you know, with did you see what the president said on Twitter, or did you, you know, did you follow this development with like him talking about North Korea? And I can tell you that some of these people that are a asking me about the president and North Korea are not people that would have been able to identify Pyongyang on a map like six months ago. And so, to me, um, that is just watching that evolve over a two-year period of time. Watching him go, uh, you know, um, like people sort of for better or for worse, have very strong opinions about him and about the presidency is a, um, you know, kind of a macro big story that I have found. Um, and, and, the, and the implications of that, you know, he, it's, a, it's a psychological weight on a lot of people, I think, and, um, or it's a psychological lift to a lot of people that he's president, and I find that to be really interesting. Okay, well, along with the Donald Kobe comparison, the term political atheist is going to be another one of our takeaways <laughs> today. So CJ, thank you. <laughs> So, Claudia, I'm going to come back to you. I've asked the other two journalists on the panel, either from the past 107 days or from the campaign that preceded it, what's the best, most interesting story that you've had a chance to cover from your perch? Uh, it's been very interesting to uh, cover this, this battle over free speech. Uh, back even when uh, uh, we had the state GOP convention in Burlingame, we had a big protest there. That was the first glimpse that I got of sort of these really violent uh, block, the, the black block, the atheists, well, I'm sorry, not the atheists, the uh, anarchists. <laughs> Leave the atheists alone. Me, sorry, the anarchists who would show up all of with their black block tactics and, uh, and really, really become quite violent. And, and actually that story was interesting because um, some of those uh, protesters did get inside that hotel and they unfurled a banner and there was a breach in security. And we, had, we saw uh, candidate Trump have to jump a freeway median to get inside and he cracked a joke about it. It was like trying to cross the border from Mexico. It was very funny. Um, but, but lately at Berkeley, um, to, see, to see how these protests have gotten so out of control in, in many cases, um, because you have one group equating anything that Trump has to say or any Trump supporters have to say as hate speech, um, and that that speech should not be heard, and to say that they're fighting for free speech when they're muffling other speech uh, has just, it, it, it kind of boggles my mind. Um, and also, in some cases, to see the police standing by and not cracking down on that has also uh, been an interesting story to cover. So I would say that this, um, this, this growing battle, especially on, on college campuses around the country, um, this battle over free speech that we're seeing, um, where uh, one side is, is, is uh, you know, squelched, is muffled. Uh, that's, and, I, and, it, and I don't know that that's you know, gonna change. Well, I, I, I'm guessing many of you picked up on this too, but I found a common thread between Seema and CJ's and Claudia's 
responses about the stories that they've been covering. And the common thread I heard was a reference in different ways to the polarization and the hyperpartisanship of the electorate. They talked about social media, about the protests, about how different people in different, uh, from different vantage points heard entirely different things. And the fact that we have, yeah, uh, the fact that we have a culture today in which people can construct their own news and information environment, what they've all said in three different ways is the way that plays out on the campaign trail as they cover it is, to, is a very, very divided electorate um, of the likes of which we haven't seen in quite some time. So Mike, I'm gonna ask you and then Johanna to take this on from a, not from a media, but from a practitioner perspective. I would think, as somebody who practiced politics way back in the old days, that if you're dealing with a hyper-partisan polarized electorate like this one, it's a lot harder for a political leader of either party to unify the country, to forge compromise, to bring us all together. Is that true? It's absolutely true. Okay. Uh, in fact, there's really very little uh, practical political value in trying anymore. And so let me, let me provide a little bit of context, step back a second. In 1980, when Ronald Reagan accepted the Republican nomination about 35, 40 days before the election, 30%, uh, according to Gallup polling, 30% of American voters were undecided. Now, when Mitt Romney accepted the Republican nomination about 45 days before the 2012 election, 3% uh, were undecided. And that number has been tightening up as, as the media and society has been segmenting and getting more and more socialized. It's really hit overdrive with social media, but as a practitioner, it's become extremely difficult to do what we used to do when I was younger and didn't have as much gray hair and had more hair on my head, and that was we used to practice persuading voters and trying to convince people and start building a coalition. And what we realized really, um, and you saw this really frankly play out in the, in the, Bill Clinton was the master of this, right? Remember triangulation? Do you remember that term? Healthcare doesn't go well when it was Hillary care. He immediately pivots into the middle after the 1994, the midterm elections, co-ops Republicans' messages, builds a strong base of support, and, and um, with a few minor problems during the latter part of his administration, he, he enjoys you know, widespread public support. You see that change markedly in the George Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, so much so that Karl Rove really recognized this trend and said, there aren't enough votes to get anymore to win a become a national party. The way you have to do it is you have to drive base. And this happened, um, the first time this really happened was in the 2002 midterms. And what you saw then was Karl Rove put on a bunch of socially conservative issues and key electoral battlegrounds, primarily on gay marriage, to drive social conservatives out to the base. And you saw that happen again in the Obama administration uh, when the uh, health care issue was faltering. Remember when Ted Kennedy passed away uh, right before the last key vote? And Massachusetts voters send Scott Brown, a Republican, in the middle of all this, to the, you know, to the U.S. Senate, Ted, in Ted Kennedy's seat, by the way. I mean, there's nothing screaming more, you know, hit the pause button, slow down here, than, than that. But he, he, there's no room to compromise with Republicans because Republicans are having none of it. So what you have to do is he has to double down and drive his own base, which Barack Obama was uniquely positioned to do with the, the emerging constituencies of America. Long way of saying... Driving base has become the primary practice of politicians and political consultants. And it's going to continue as long as the media segments because persuading people is a very, very, very difficult, expensive, and tricky enterprise. And if you don't believe me, let me just ask you, don't have to blurt this out, but how many of you were undecided between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump 30 days before the election? Right? Very, very few, if any of you. I, I would go with none. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's much more the diplomat than I am, but that's exactly right. And so what, what, what is unfortunately happening is, in, is, is a practitioner, and as the media further segments, and it's why you see the rise of not just Fox News on the right, but Breitbart sites on the, on, on the right, and you know, Vox on the left, and other groups that are just popping up, speaking to narrow constituencies and monetizing that constituency, the way you monetize it is by getting people riled up. The unfortunate evolution of that is fake news. 
And who would have thought that Russians would be better practitioners of persuading people in elections than you know, American political consultants who we've, we think we've been doing it so well for the past couple hundred years. So that, all of this is unfortunately this predictable um, evolution or devolution of what is happening and it is making it extremely difficult to not only build consensus, but frankly, uh, it, it makes it uh, politically disadvantageous, is that a word? To actually even try. I it, so go ahead. Oh, no, no, I, have to, I, well, I was gonna say, it, 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 the efficiencies, as we would call it, it, the efficiencies on your spend is better spent on uh, further intensifying your base as opposed to reaching across to other people who even may agree with you on a core set of issues. And I think we would probably agree that Americans agree on probably a lot more than we disagree on, but we are so now preconditioned to be angry that who is saying what is more important than what is being said. And I don't trust the other side because that, they, they watch MSNBC or they watch Fox or they're reading this or they're really, you know, and we, we, we have become the enemy. And that's the unfortunate part is because it is becoming, again, not only very difficult, but it's becoming um, a disadvantage to try to build consensus. Well, well Mike, several, several really interesting points. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask Johanna and then the others to weigh in on them. But for those of you who attended our programs last fall, at least one of the, a couple of the things that Mike mentioned might ring a little bit familiar because we talked about it then. Some of what Mike talks about, I would argue, is simply human nature. It's only human nature to want to talk to, to listen to, the read, to read the smartest people in the world. Who are the smartest people in the world? Well, they're the people who agree with me. <laughs> and we might find them on different talk radio shows or on different blogs or on different websites or on different Facebook pages. But there's sort of this national gravitational pull, if I understand what you're saying, Mike, that pulls us there and leaves a lot of responsibility to us to resist that nat natural pull as citizens to be willing to seek out the other side. And to me, once again, that's really the great value and great virtue of the Chautauqua series. I'll offer a statistic to back up uh, the point that Mike was making about the trends in polarization. He talked about the differences between the Reagan and the Romney eras. Um, when I went to Washington in, in, in 1984, if you had lined up all the, uh, set, uh, the 100 United States senators on an ideological spectrum from left to right, the number of Republican senators who occupied the space to the left of the most conservative Democratic senator, and along with that, the number of Democratic senators who occupied the space to the right of the most liberal Republican senator, you, you see where I'm going here, senators who, who crossed over, 62 of the 100 United States senators occupied the space that I just described. The corresponding number in the year 2017, of course, is zero. So now, what, what Mike has done is he's laid out a pretty stark argument, not just that we are a polarized country, but that makes it either more difficult and maybe not even worth trying for political leaders to try to forge that common ground. Johanna, what do you think about that? Well, um, I, I guess I have a little bit of a a unique perspective here. I often joke that I came out to my family as a Democrat. Um, they were all Republicans, and uh, I I told them all. Um, it was a Christmas dinner, and I uh, was arguing with them all, and I, I said, you know, George Bush is going to take us to war, and you all are going to regret this, and it was interesting because um, at that dinner, not a single person backed me, and in fact, um, they all disagreed with me, and uh, eight years later, it was really a different dynamic. So I started at the very beginning of the Iowa caucuses for President Obama, and um, I remember that before that, um, they said that George W. Bush and Karl Rove had created a um, permanent majority and that there was no way we were ever going to win. Uh, not only you know, was Barack Obama never going to win, but the Democrats were never going to win again. Um, we started in Iowa, and it was very much a grassroots effort uh, pulling people from these, um, you know, various community centers, retirement centers, schools. Um, we had Barack stars, our high school students, um, who would come and we would do town halls. And, um, and we would talk about, you know, what 
Americans are most concerned about, um, and they were overwhelmingly healthcare. Um, they were overwhelmingly their economic situation. They were um, very much, you know, the future. They're worried about our future. Um, Barack Obama spent a lot of time talking with people about that. Um, you know, we, we went to the White House. This was a man who I wanted to work for so badly because in 2004, he talked about, you know, those red states and blue states. He talked about my hometown, Galesburg, Illinois, which is a manufacturing town um, that lost its manufacturing base. And a lot of um, people in Galesburg lost jobs, including my brother, who was a big Trump supporter. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing that I've seen is um, he got to Washington, and it, it's not that um, I think that Americans have no, no width to compromise, but in Washington, no one was willing to compromise. And I remember being part of us opening up um, a Republican caucus meeting. So President Obama was going to visit with the Republican caucus, and it was going to be a closed press meeting. And at the last minute, we changed it to open it up to press because President Obama wanted to say to people in front of the press, some of you were my friends in Illinois. We worked together. And now you're not willing to work with me on anything. And that's not good for America. And, and so, you know, I get very frustrated now that we are fueling, you know, an opposition in the sense that Democrats watched the Republicans do it for eight years and saw that it was successful. Yeah, we could play the opposition role and say, no, 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 no. But in the sense that the Americans are on the train tracks when that train's going to crash, that's not okay. And I don't think it's okay for our politicians to take that easy political and kind of manipulative stance on either side. So to the degree that I want people to recognize that compromise is not evil, but rather can get us to a place where Americans aren't on the train tracks during a, a you know, healthcare crash, I think that would be a beneficial thing. So I don't think that Americans don't compromise. I don't think that we are in a position where, you know, there one, I, I know there's a, a lot of divide on media, but I also do know that there are people who were undecided, who are willing to listen. I, I believe that we're doing a disservice, both as politicians, just telling them what we want to hear and not going into the d depth of issues and both um, as journalists, I think we actually need more of the, our journalistic entities to set the agenda and not just follow the politicians um, with everything that they're saying. Great. And by the way, I think you'll find that applauding our panelists is a very cathartic experience, so please don't hold back over the course of the second hour. I think we'd all agree that it's something that they uh, th that they deserve. We're at about the halfway point, and so in just a few minutes we're going to begin to collect your, uh, your question card. So if you haven't had a chance to write down a question yet, take the next few minutes and write something down while we continue. Seema, I want to pick up um, on uh, one of the main points that Johanna made. And I'm going to quote from your newspaper, from the Los Angeles Times. I'm going to cite two different stories. Um, the Los Angeles Times reported about a week or so ago that when U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein held the first town halls of her career, she was booed by progressive Democrats because she had voted for not all, not even most, but some of the president's cabinet nominees and because she was not willing to commit herself to a single-payer health care system. She was booed. Um, I also read in the Times today, just before I came over here, that Kevin Mar McCarthy, the House Majority Leader, is now going to be facing an opponent in next year's election, not a uh, a Democrat running from, a, from the left, but a more conservative Republican running against him from the right, who believes that he, McCarthy, has sold out the conservative cause. But when we hear Mike and Johanna talk about the polarization, regardless of how it makes sense to approach it, this isn't something the politicians are making up. They're certainly not standing up to it, 
but this is coming from somewhere else, isn't it? I, mean, I think there's a couple of different things going on here. Um, yesterday, uh, Ohio Governor John Kasich, he was speaking at the uh, Nixon Library, and he has a new book out. And one of the things he was talking about was gerrymandering and how, you know, back in the day when he was in Congress, if you were in a safe district, that gave you room to make a, da a risky vote, to perhaps go against your party. But now, if you're in a safe district, quote unquote safe district, um, you have to, he, feel, he felt like, you have to you know, take the most partisan position, otherwise you're gonna be attacked by, if you're a Republican, you're gonna be attacked by somebody on the right, if you're a Democrat, you're gonna be attacked by somebody on the left. And this is something that, um, obviously, uh, former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger has made a big priority. You know, we've changed the way that we draw lines in, in this state. Um, but I, this is, I'm hearing more and more politicians talk about this issue and whether this is something that, you know, if, if we could deal with it across the country, if that would ease some of the gridlock that you just talked about. Um, but then, you know, no political party I mean, no offense, guys. <laughs> no political party wants to give up power, right? So I mean, it's it's a, it's a tough battle, and it's one that would have, have to you know waged in every state. So I don't think that this is any sort of um, immediate remedy. Um, so that's what one I, that's what uh, McCarthy that fight made me think of. In terms of Feinstein, I mean, I think this is the Democratic Party is at a turning point that the Republican Party was at you know eight eight years ago, where they're trying to define themselves. Um, we're seeing this in, this is like a little in the weeds, apologies, but there's a, a race to be the new state party chairman of this, or woman, of the California Democratic Party. And there's, you know, this influx of Bernie supporters who are sort of anti-establishment, quote unquote. So there's what's normally a very boring race is actually turned into a very exciting race if you're an insider and who enjoys wonky poli like political stuff like that, like me. Um, but it's, it's like more broadly, and this is where Feinstein comes in, uh, it's a, it's a debate in the Democratic Party about where do they go next? You know, do they go back to the Bill Clinton blue dog model, or do they follow this Bernie model that in, you know that inspired so much passion? And I think she's really bearing you know some of the brunt of this right now because, you know, she's I, I she, for some reason she's she and Barbara Boxer basically voted exactly the same, but she's always been viewed as the more conservative Democrat. That you know, and perhaps it's because of her views on national security and intelligence. But largely, she's you know she's pretty much been Democratic mainstream. But she's really been painted now as this establishment, maybe kind of neocon, you know, Democrat. So she's facing a lot of anger from this left, from this energized left. And this is the energized left that we're also seeing, like at the protests that you mentioned. You know, whether it was the women's march or the science <coughs> march or the income tax march or the marches that we seem to have you know, every weekend. So, so I think there's two different things going on there. Um, and in California, I think the question about wh where the Democratic Party goes is really interesting because A, we have a really interesting governor's race that's coming up, and B, California has sort of become the liberal resistance to Trump in terms of so much policy, whether it's immigration, climate change, health care. So many of the issues that he is talking about are issues that, you know, that this state has been on the leading edge of. So where the Democratic Party goes not only nationally, but in California, I think it's just going to be, it's going to be so, so important in this presidency. Claudia? Well, I just want to say um, on, at a local level, at least in the Bay Area, that I specifically cover, um, we see our, our local jurisdictions, our local city councils, our supervisors trying to one-up each other in trying to you know, seize every opportunity to pass a resolution, for instance, that we're going to not do business with companies that help build the wall. Or you know, we, we, we just see they're falling over each other trying to you know be out in front and yes we hear you and yes we agree with you because they want to get reelected or you know they want to feel like we're listening to you and 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 so we there's very little opposition from any of the city leaders in the Bay Area to any of this. That's I was just going to add that. Thank you, Claudia. CJ, did you want to weigh in on this? No, I'm good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, before we go on to the next question, I wanna, I wanna go back to a point that Seema made, because it's a critically important one, where she talked about the way our congressional uh, districts are drawn in this country. And California is one of the rare exceptions, where, as all of you know, our elected officials do not draw their own district lines. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of in my own career is many years ago, I co-chaired a group called the Voices of Reform that laid out the original principles for redistricting reform that ultimately led to the initiative that Governor Schwarzenegger uh, passed into law. Um, in most states, as all of you know, uh, politicians draw their own district lines, which I think is sort of like letting teenagers set their own curfews. Um, you can start the day, the day with the most noble of intentions, but the hour gets late and self-interest takes over and bad, things, and bad things happen. And what that means, as Seema correctly pointed out, is if you are a member of Congress from 47 of the other 49 states, you know your district has been drawn to protect you. It's a conservative Republican or a liberal Democratic district, and you know you will never, ever lose a re-election campaign to a member of the other party. 
which means, of course, as she indicated, the only way you'll ever lose that job is not to someone from the other side, but to an even more conservative Republican or an even more liberal Democrat, an even more ideologically intense member of your own party. And so from a pure cost benefit standpoint, the overwhelming majority of members of Congress think, I can do anything I want to, and I can get reelected, and I can keep the sweet gig. I can do anything, with the exception, possibly, of compromising with the other side. <laughs> because then I will get a more conservative opponent or a more liberal opponent, depending on my party, who runs against me as a, who runs against me as a sellout. And there has been some talk about a national redistricting effort. The ads are against it for precisely the reasons that Seema mentioned. If you are one of the 400 plus members of Congress who benefits by the current system, there's not much incentive to change it. But for those of you who watched the health care vote this week, and I, I know that's all of you, you notice that seven California Republicans, all representing districts that were won by Hillary Clinton this last election, they all voted for the health care bill. Now you might think that's a good thing, you might think that's a bad thing. But because their districts were drawn not themselves, but by a citizen's commission, that means that they will be asked to defend their vote next year. And if they are defeated, it will be because the voters in the district decided that was the wrong vote. If they are reelected, it's because the voters will have made a decision that it was the correct one. But either way, it's an entirely unique perspective in this country where the voters will actually get to decide whether it was right or wrong, rather than having the decision made for them. All right, we now return you to your regularly scheduled program. Sorry about that. <laughs> so what I'd like to do before we, before, before we get to your questions is I'm going to ask the group, um, each of you individually, what are we missing? What is a story? What is something that's happening, either in the political process or beyond politics, that we in day 107 of the Trump presidency, what should we be paying more attention to? CJ, what are we missing? Uh, sure. Well, I think that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about President Trump and, and kind of the way he uh, carries himself in office. I find this to be a useful uh, exercise every day. I write down literally everything he did that day. So, if that, if, so today he woke up in Bedminster, New Jersey, played a round of golf. I'd write that down. Um, and then I look at literally the actions he's taking as president. And the reason that I do this um, it's not because I want to know how many times he, he's golfed or how many times he's traveled, which are interesting factual nuggets, but to really kind of, um, I find myself missing really basic things that he, actions he's taking as president because there is so much going on. Um, and so I would encourage you, you know, it's um, as, you know, kind of as, as voters or concerned citizens to literally just look at what he's doing. Um, because on a day like Thursday where, where um, coverage was rightly guided by this giant um, you know, uh, victory for Trump and House Republicans in, in the first step of repealing uh, the Affordable Care Act, President Trump also signed a, an executive order on religious liberty that will have an immediate and more practical effect on the citizens of the United States. Um, every day, um, little things like that are, are um, occurring and, and you don't need to cast motives on, on whether you're whether they're trying to sweep something under the rug or something that's not really what I'm talking about it's just that there's a um, this is an action oriented presidency and so um, you know like chronicling the actions of it is a really important exercise for me I think CJ thank you very much Claudia I know you've been thinking a lot about this and I think the audience is gonna be very interested in hearing the story that you've picked up on because it doesn't sound political at the outset, but ultimately no. it is, isn't it? Well, I think it's going to be, and I think it's really going to be a big game changer in the years to come. And, and um, I cover a lot of technology, uh, Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs, and when you have people like Elon Musk and others talking about uh, the future of automation and uh, how that is just going to revolutionize how we work and whether we will need to go to college uh, and universal basic income uh, paying somebody just to be alive so that everybody has some sort of an income. Uh, I, I really think that's going to be a story that we're going to have to pay attention to because if, if you're doing a job that can be somehow predictable or routine and not just assembly line stuff either. Uh, I mean, robots now are getting so good 
Uh, they can see, they can predict, and they can do uh, a job. I mean, look at self-driving cars and self-driving trucks. There's three million truckers uh, out there who earn a good living. It's not an easy life, but they earn a good living. You know, their jobs are may not going to, they may not be around uh, in, in 50 years. Um, things will get done differently, and I think that's going to have to be a national conversation about how uh, we're going to uh, reduce income inequality and, you know, again, basic income. Where, what's going to happen down there? What's going to happen down the road with, with automation and the emerging technology as it's going? Yeah, and one, a, a critically important topic, and if you stop and think about it for a minute, you realize that even though Claudia framed it to her credit in the real, real world context, not in the context of politics, it's a topic that maybe more than any other drove last year's presidential election. Both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders realized extraordinary political benefit by warning about the downside of broader trade with other countries. I think a lot of smart people in both parties would agree that as much as trade might be a potential threat to a lot of the type of working class workers that both appealed to, in fact, it's advances in technology that create a much greater challenge and if you look at the voters who uh, populated the base of Trump's campaign, disproportionately, they are those workers who will be the most impacted, already have been the most impacted, by the types of changes in technology that Claudia is talking about. Fascinating point, and hopefully we have time to come back to it in a little bit more detail. Um, Johanna, I want to come to you. Same question. What are we missing? What should yeah. we be paying attention to that we're not? I actually wanted to expand on that because I do think that globalization, climate change, and technology are changing the world so rapidly and that we are not doing a good enough job to educate um, everyone on what that means. And, um, and specific to your point, I think a lot of people think that it's trade that's taking people's jobs when actually trade is a real opportunity for us to uh, remain um, the power that we are if we do it effectively, if we trade effectively, and if we um, if we pull away from all of these uh, trade partnerships, I think we actually endanger um, ourselves and our uh, competitiveness. We were talking earlier even about immigration. Um, if you look at, it was Rob Kaplan, is a, he was back at the Dole Institute at the same time I was. He's a president of Fed um, in Dallas, president and CEO of Fed in Dallas. He was talking about um, the number of baby boomers that we have retiring and the reality of um, us needing you know, more uh, workplace uh, productivity and um, to that degree, more people working, which he was saying you know, just shows um, statistically how we need to actually improve our immigration policies to get more people here working to support all of the uh, Medicaid and Social Security entitlements. So the future of our economy is um, very much uh, in flux, and I think that you know, in the debate that we had in this uh, political climate, we focused a lot on um, people personally, and we focused a lot on um, some uh, sensationalized drama and um, some you know, things that uh, they do matter because words matter. Um, but we didn't focus enough on the future of America and what th that, should, that should look like and how um, politics and regulation and how um, our leaders are planning to um, protect us in a, a new economy. And so to that end, I feel like we have to change that conversation and um, look at you know, exactly what you're talking about with technology, um, lean into some of those, you know, like TPP, both sides of both extremes of the parties decided they hated TPP. And we did a call on TPP after it was like Obama expats, and we did a call. Um, the guy who had negotiated it was talking about it, and he said, you know, people are going to attack this for all these various reasons, but, you know, you should know that it's, number one, it's the best that we could manage to get, and that actually says something because a lot of times people will just not do anything because <laughs> they can't do it all but sometimes just doing something is what you need to do and so with TPP they were doing um, they had 
you know, child protection laws, child uh, labor protection laws. They had animal cruelty laws. They had, you know, a number of different uh, different components that were really under covered, like under um, n really never covered. Um, it, and so no one really understood it. No one talked about it. And then Donald Trump, um, as president, effectively pulled out of it. Um, it's something we're not discussing here, but Japan has already brought it up again. So um, to that end, you know, in, in terms of global trade, I think that's still a conversation that we're not leading on. And I think we have to lead on if we're going to remain uh, the power that America has been. Well, I think Joanna uh, raises an excellent point, and it's a perfect compliment, actually, I would argue, to the one that, 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 that Claudia was making. Because once again, you're talking um, about changes, not just in politics, but in the economy and society, that sub-segments of society are better prepared to handle than others. And if you don't want to take Johanna's word for it, well, you should, because she's smart, but if you don't want to take Johanna's word for it or my word for it, um, I would point to you to a speech that Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, gave last week, in which he was talking about this. And not only was he talking about the benefits of free trade, which is what you'd expect from a Wall Street leader, he was saying, we have to do a better job, as Johanna was, of explaining to people what the benefits to these to the, to the, to trade opportunities are. And he said, we have to be more conscious that not everyone gains as a result of them. And we have to do more in order to make sure those people have the type of support that they need. I think a point that once again, although maybe not made in quite those words, was a critically important component of both the Trump and the Sanders campaigns. Saying to those voters least prepared for these types of changes, I might not have the answers, but at least I'm listening. Mike, what are we missing? What should we be paying attention to? Uh, well, I, I think this is a great conversation. I think it's exactly where um, I, I, I agree with everything with, with what everybody just said. I, I, would, I do want to take it a step further um, because I think there are some fundamental changes that have already happened that we just aren't equipped to understand um, because we are used to practicing politics and our governance under the current construct. Um, so let me just throw some things out with the qualifier that I, I don't have a dystopian belief of the future and I don't believe that the world's coming to an end or that it's calamitous, but I believe in the very near future we're going to challenge some very fundamental notions as a society that um, are, are commonplace to us. Uh, things, the notion of representative government I think is going to dramatically change with the advent of technology. I think this notion of the political spectrum being about right and left really already doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And um, while I agree with Johanna, I, I don't believe that it's the extremes of both parties that were coming to agreement. I don't think that Donald Trump really occupies the far right of the political spectrum as we knew it on the conservative side, or that Bernie Sanders was on the far left of the progressive or liberal side. We're starting to see a politics where we're no longer discussing about the role of government being big or small. It's really more kind of haves and have nots. You know, whereas David Brooks would characterize as insiders versus outsiders, closed society versus a transparent society. And it's not an American phenomenon, right? It's the Brexit stuff. It's what's happening with Marine Le Pen's campaign. It's happening all over, and I would argue, not just the Western world. But if you look close, you're starting to see with some of the uprisings in the Middle East, a lot of this is class-driven. And this separation, this dramatic separation that technology has enabled, about haves and have-nots and who allocates what and the view that we can have free trade and we can have uh, globalization lifting everybody up. I happen to subscribe to that. That's kind of the, used to be a bedrock foundation to the conservative uh, side of the aisle. Now it's kind of the shrinking part of it because it's really no longer, I think, the ascendant part of the, of the Republican ideology. But what is happening is we're starting to see a transnational political movements where people in rural England and rural France have more in common with rural America than they do with people in the metropolitan areas of their own countries and are behaving that way. And so to, 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 to think that we can act as a sole actor with our system of governance, I think is an outdated notion already. And it's why we're seeing the gridlock that we're seeing and the inability to come to consensus. And so while I enjoy talking about things like the first 100 days or redistricting reform, I really don't think that that's what's going on.
Seema, you get the last shot at this one. What, what should we be paying more attention to? What's something that we're not looking at the way we need to be? If, can I just add one little thing to that discussion first? And then, um, so shortly before the election, I went to this county outside of Des Moines that um, used to have the Maytag factory there. They'd make Maytag dishwashers. President Obama won it twice. Yeah. It went for um, President Trump this election. And talking to people there, it wasn't, it's exactly it, it, what you guys are talking about. It wasn't about left or right. It wasn't about Democrat or Republican. It was about, like, our way of life is gone. You used to be able to have, like, a high school degree, and you used to be able to buy a house and take your kids on vacation because you could work at this plant. One out of every four towns people worked at this plant. That, and that doesn't exist anymore. And with automation, we're going to see so much more of that. So I think, I think that's exactly right. That is such a critical story in the future. Um, beyond that, in terms of what we're missing, I feel, and this is more basic, and I think this goes all, you know, to what you were talking about earlier, there is so much information happening and so much stuff happening every day out of this administration that it's like a fire hose, and I just don't know how to keep up. I, don't, I think we're all struggling with how to keep up and what to prioritize, what not to prioritize. You know, I was on a panel a couple weeks ago, and people were like, why do you have to report what Donald Trump tweets? Well, he's the leader of the free world. We have to report what he tweets. But sometimes that takes up all the air in the room while he's also doing some policy. Um, you know, the, I think back to the travel ban, the first version of the travel ban. That was obviously huge news. You had thousands of people in Los Angeles voluntarily going to LAX on a Friday night, which you know, given like the hell that is LAX, yeah. that shows how much passion you know people had about this issue. But at the same time, he was remaking the uh, the makeup of the National Security Council. That got completely buried. So, I think, and I'm not just saying this for the LA Times. I think that the media in general, we are still trying to figure out how to cover this administration because it is just so unlike any administration I think any of us have previously seen. Well. If left to my own devices, I would happily take the rest of our time together and ask more and more questions of our panelists. Um, but Andy and Cecile would get really mad at me, and I do have a stack of very, very interesting questions from many of you. I'm going to apologize in advance for not being able to ask all of them, or even as many as that I would like to. But what I would tell you is that for those of you who would like, our panelists, after the formal conclusion of our program at 6.30, have agreed to stay around for a short period of time and answer questions more informally. So if your question was not answered to your satisfaction or was not asked, hopefully you'll be able to get one more chance at them. So with that apology in mind, I want to start out with the first question. And this is from one of our very impressive high school students. This is Dolly of Oak Grove, Oak Grove School. Dolly, thank you very much for the question she wants to know. Guys, during the campaign, did the images of the candidates on social media greatly influence the results of the election? So we talked about Trump and Twitter and what that means, but more broadly, how big of a role did social media play in this campaign? Seema, do you wanna take a first crack at that? I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, in terms of Twitter, I'm kind of divided on this because, I mean, how many people in this room are on Twitter? Uh, Very few. So that's the thing. Like most, most reg like normal people are not largely on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> you have, I mean, in, in politics, you have journalists. <laughs> that none of us are normal. <laughs> um, no, but you have journalists. You have um, influence makers, allegedly. You know, you have strategists. You have, pol you know, so you have people who might drive the news of the day. But, but I don't. I, I, so I'm not sure that social media, in and of itself, made a difference. I think it was. Um, I think the media pollsters and the Hillary Clinton campaign misunderstood the electorate. I think, as you said earlier, Donald Trump was a master marketer who we all underestimated. Um, and he certainly used social media to his advantage, but I don't know that that was a defining, uh, a defining feature of the campaign. But what do you guys think? CJ. I will, I will agree with Tima that normal people aren't generally on Twitter or engaging in it the way. And I would also say, um, uh, you know, I, I can't quantify what Twitter meant to this particular presidential election, except that I would say that for a lot of Trump supporters in particular, um, it was a venue they took to and it had a galvanizing effect on his message. And by that I mean um, they went there, they saw people who were saying and thinking similar things, and uh, as I think um, Mike and Johanna would both agree, when you're Dealing with a political campaign, you know, one of the core challenges that um, you have is is bringing people together around a common idea, and you there are different tactical methods to doing that. And I think that Twitter certainly played a part in that component of President Trump's campaign. Excellent. 
let's go on to the, we've got a lot of questions here, so I want to keep going through them. Um, another student, we have Liz Spiller from Villanova, and she has a question. Um, and I'm going to let our, I'm going to, I'm going to ask our two, uh, uh, our two politicos, as opposed to our journalists, take a crack at this one. Um, the question basically says, Trump has approached the presidency, and Liz, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I hope that's okay with you, has approached the presidency in a very non-traditional manner. And the nature of the question talks less about policy matters, and we'll come back to that, than just sort of the way he approaches the presidency and the way he presents himself. As two political communications professionals, talk a little bit, if you can, about the non-traditional way that Trump communicates with the public, not just Twitter, not just the means through which he communicates, but what he says and how he does it. Johanna? I would say it's masterful, actually. I would give him credit that um, he, so to win any campaign, um, we've talked about this a lot, but you need money and oxygen. And he has so much oxygen that <laughs> we, um, <laughs> I mean, he's he's winning. I think back to what CJ was talking about with the the truck parked in this garage. Um, it, it, you know, it is good to see our citizens, citizenry involved. It, it would have been great if during President Obama's term, we could have had some of those folks engaged and involved in calling Republicans and helping us get people to compromise at that point in time. It's interesting we, uh, when you're looking at you know how he communicates and goes direct to the people, you're right that most normal people are not on Twitter, but they are seeing all the stories that are coming from his Twitter feed in either their Facebook feed or their Snapchat or wherever they do live online, where whatever they're consuming, they're hearing that. Yeah, on your websites, um, they're they're getting his messages. So he both, you know, knowing the medium of cable TV and of TV presence and knowing how to go direct to people, um, he is he's, is doing a phenomenal job. And I will say that, you know, we had to learn on the job with our social media um, strategy, but we were at the time that, you know, we were just getting iPhones for the first time. <laughs> we were we were pretty um, ahead of the curve, I would argue. Um, with President Obama. Now, he did not directly tweet. He was the first um, president, I believe, to have a BlackBerry. Um, so, you know, these, these things change, but in the sense of him as a communicator, um, I would say that he, he's pretty effective. Mike. Yeah, I remember the debate in uh, 2000. The, the, the last word was pretty, pretty effective. Effective, effective yeah. I remember the, the debate in 2008 was, was a lot of the media was asking, is the president going to keep his BlackBerry, yeah. right? He was the first BlackBerry president. It's like, you know, now that's going to be in a, the Smithsonian. I think Trump <laughs> people know what, what that even means. Um, but look, every, every presidency from now on will start to redefine new uses of technology. And I think Dan alluded to that earlier. I remember Howard Dean was raising money on the internet in Iowa and everybody was like, their jaw was dropping. Like, how is he raising all that money in $5 increments? Now that's just a very standard practice um, of with, with what we do. Um, look, when, when I fully realized the impact that this was going to have, and again, recognizing that not everybody was on Twitter, was when I was at that convention in Burlingame, that Republican convention, and Trump shows up, and so it's a media swarm, and I meet this young digital reporter from CNN, probably 23 or 24 years old, and he wanted to talk about Latino politics or something, and I said, I gotta, before we get into that, I mean, why do you guys keep, like, why, why, I mean, I haven't seen a press person at a Republican convention in 20 years, right, in California. Now we can't, you know, uh, close the doors here. And he said, you have no idea how much money we're making yeah. by running Trump stories. Yeah. If I just blog three or four times on CNN about Trump anything, that's my job, is to just, just kick stuff out there. And the, and the media, when it's monetized that way, it literally cannot not cover him. Mm -hmm. It can't. It can't survive without it. And he, they knew that. Bannon knew that. Trump knew that. And so he is leading the media narrative in a way that no president ever has. And I think that's what, she, what in part, what, what, what John is saying by saying he's a master communicator. Not necessarily that he has the eloquence of Barack Obama or the presence of a Ronald Reagan. He understands the tactics of leading with the tip of the spear so that the media has to, because the way it's monetized, cover what he's doing. Even, and I would argue, especially the opposition. The New York Times subscription rates and the LA Times subscription rates are going through the roof. 
MSNBC just came back from the dead, right? <laughs> because suddenly everyone is the anger, the anger that was fueling the Trump rise on the right is now on the left. One of the great phenomenons is the fake news phenomenon on the left now because money is moving, the clickbait just moves. It's a, it's a market, unfortunately. Um, and so that is just the way we are going to operate and how we figure that out as a society and how our institutions like the, the press lead us or follow us or work hand in hand with us is going to be fundamentally different. It's one of those things I was talking about. The way the press handles the Trump administration now compared to what it's going to be at the end of this first term, I think are gonna be markedly different, markedly different. You're gonna hear, there will be news sources that you were not even aware of in 18 months or two years that are probably being dreamed up somewhere um, I don't want to say in Ukraine, I was going to say something else, but, but somewhere <laughs> they're being dreamed up um, to, to, you know, to, to, to drive this, this monetization of, of clicks. Okay, so yeah. I've got, a, I've got a, a related question that I'm going to bring to you, Claudia, not necessarily from the beat you cover, but as a longtime uh, respected uh, broadcast journalist. And the question is, I think, a follow-up on the points that Mike and Johanna have been making said, to, to what extent did Trump's experience with The Apprentice, to what extent did that help him shape this approach to communications, and to what extent did that presence help him develop his base of support? Well, I think we have always known of Donald Trump being a, a maverick, uh, someone outside the box, somebody pretty unconventional, somebody who's uber confident. I think people were drawn to his swagger uh, I think people were drawn to his uh, winning, you know, he would stand there in the debate saying, we're, I'm winning. And, okay. <laughs> and sure enough, he was winning. Uh, so I think he had an appeal to uh, obviously a lot of people uh, who voted for him. And I, I think he's taken that, that swagger and his, you know, he doesn't care uh, if people like him or not. Uh, again, he's not trying to build a consensus really, um, and, and it's working for, for him uh, to some degree. Uh, he thinks he's doing a great job. I mean, even in the Rose Garden the other day, he couldn't help himself. He's like, I'm the president <laughs> with, with the House Republicans behind him. <laughs> How often do you see a president 106 days in saying, I'm the president? <laughs> so I, I think uh, people can relate to him. He, he, he seems to you know just really appeal to to, uh, to, the, to those voters who supported him. And I see them in Northern California, far north, uh, the people who want the state of Jefferson, uh, the people who are fiercely independent and who want reduced government and, and all, all of those things. But um, I, I, th I think that uh, the person who, who brought us The Apprentice is, is still that person. I, I think with Donald Trump, you, you know what you're getting. I don't think he's changed. Um, before we go on, um, only one of our questioners, uh, I didn't ask you specifically to do it, but one questioner did, uh, in addition to her question, or, or his question, offered their guess as to which of our two panelists were married. And I will, and I will simply say that for the person who guessed, the answer, your guess is incorrect. Mike and CJ are not our married couple <laughs> on the stage. <laughs> Okay, but 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 points for but, but points for imagination. Um, so we, 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 I want to get back. To, we're talking some fairly big, pretty broad topics here, and I want to get back to them. But one question, or one of the questions, really brings us down to a much more specific level. CJ, is this health care bill going to pass? Uh, here's a good thing to do with President Trump that reporters don't often do. I don't know. <laughs> no predictions. Um, OK, here's what I would say. Uh, watching, watching the process unfold over the first 107 days, uh, specifically with health care, um, it's unusual to see um, the president, uh, you know, as you said, declare in the Rose Garden, I am president, but really spike a football when you're maybe a third of the way through a, a really, um, to, you know, to put it his way, bigly uh, complicated legislative process. Um, we know that the Senate is going to do some things to the current um, House health bill or ignore it altogether. Um, like our uh, Politico's reporting has shown that already. I think um, 
you know, senators are very skeptical of the way this bill was drawn. Um, and I don't think that I can make a, pre I mean, I honestly, like, I'm, I'm joking that it's not a good idea to make predictions about President Trump, but I don't think that I could actually predict the outcome of this legislative process because there are so many different components here. I would say that when you look at um, all of the stakeholders <coughs> here who are in power, um, they're committed to getting um, some form of Obamacare repeal and replace passed. Um, Mitch McConnell, who can be hard to read, has shown a pretty, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, has shown a pretty um, concrete appetite for taking this on, although perhaps not the way the House has indicated it wants to take it on. Um, I think, and obviously President Trump has, um, you know, is, is very animated about this process. Uh, I would say that where you have to, if you want to like try to get an idea for how it's going to play out, Watch what the Senate does with its bill, which I think is the most always been the most important step in this process, um, because uh, despite some changes in the way Washington has worked, the Senate is still more of a consensus body, and the margins there are much slimmer than in the House. Um, see what emerges from there, and then watch how um, House Republicans react to it. Are they um, inclined to, uh, you know, play to some of the you know, ignore any problems that, you know, they might not have ignored in drafting the bill this time and just plow forward for a victory? Or are they going to have some of the ideological fights that sort of characterize the first um, attempt to get health care, a health care repeal and replace passed? Great. CJ, thank you. Um, Mike and Johanna, um, when you were talking about the benefits or I should say the likelihood or unlikelihood of compromise in politics, you clearly touched a chord with our group here because I have a stack of questions specifically related to that back and forth. I've picked the one that I think frames it in the most compelling way, and I'll ask you each to address it. If we agree that a successful democracy is dependent on the principle of compromise, if we are saying that there is no compromise, are we saying democracy as we know it is dead? Mike? I'll pass. No. <laughs> uh, uh, democracy. Or you can talk about the health care bill, which I'm yeah. really <laughs> Democracy as we know it, that's what I was alluding to earlier, I, I believe is dying. And I don't, look, I don't think that's a bad thing. Okay? There are very few things that have existed for 250 years that we still use all the time. Okay? There are some basic governing principles that we have to abide by. But look, I don't believe, and I, I appreciated the applause on the, on the compromise. You know, we all want to compromise, but I think it was you know, wise when Dan asked how many of you were undecided. Compromise really means to people, I want you to agree with me. They'll, you know, everyone will say that's not what I mean, but that's what they mean, okay? And, and especially, especially when you throw an R or a D in front of something. It just, it is so polarizing, I, it's, 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 it's almost unmanageable. So and that's why I also said I believe some of the basic foundations of representative government are really shaking right now because we used to be afraid if you made these more moderate districts that, you know, a, a moderate Democrat could get, uh, take out a conservative Republican if they went too far. The challenges are now coming from the right and from the left. Nancy Pelosi has drawn a challenger from the left, right? Kevin McCarthy has drawn one from the right. I don't believe in a technological age when I can pull out an app right now and have 80 pizzas delivered to me even in Ojai, right, at the whim of a button, that I, I'm going to trust somebody to go to Congress and vote for me on these key issues. Something is going to have to change with the way we interact in the filter that we, uh, first, this grand American experiment that you know, we talked about in the Federalist Papers to prevent mob rule, right, this representative government is going to have to adapt. It is not going to look the same way in a decade the way that it does now. I don't think it's going to go away entirely, but especially in the California political tradition where we tell pollsters all the time we hate ballot measures, but boy, we sure love them when they come up, right? We love direct democracy. There's going to be, have to be some sort of safety valve that is going to allow for greater voter participation amongst those that are engaged to be in, in, engaged. and and. I don't foresee, I, I, look, I could be wrong, but I, the 30-year trend is towards less compromise. It's not towards more, and it's becoming more and more institutionalized and regionalized by geography, by ethnicity, by gender, by virtually every metric. We are cementing ourselves into these areas where we're no longer conditioned to believe that compromise is a value. 
the way that we used to. In fact, it's, it's, it's a bad thing, okay? So that's why I said democracy as we know it, I don't wanna say it's dying, it's changing. It's changing, it's just going through some very painful. So Johanna, before you weigh in, um, I wanna uh, take a, a moment to, to talk to Mike's points, because I think they're important. My role as a moderator, of course, is, is to moderate and to stay out of the fray, but Mike makes a couple of really important points, and frankly, I just can't help myself, and I have a microphone, so, so deal with it. First of all, and this is why Mike's my friend and why I so admire him, the reason Mike is such a master communicator, if you notice what he did, and he did it very, very well, I say this as a genuine admirer, he started out with a very stark sentence that grabbed every one of our attention. He said, democracy's dying. And then a little while after that, he said, democracy will have to adapt. And then a little bit after that, he said, democracy isn't necessarily dying, but it's changing. And our bill passed. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and this, this is not criticism at all, but it's, it's, taking, it's taking a step back to look at the way communications worked. He grabbed our attention with a very provocative statement. And then he didn't contradict himself. He just added some context that made it maybe less compelling, but more valuable. And as I could tell from the body language of my fellow panelists and all 180 of you, certainly succeeded in his task. So I'm gonna just say a couple of things before I'm gonna give Joanna a chance to weigh in because while I think Mike is one of the smartest people I know, I disagree with him on a couple of points that he made. One, he made it just in passing. He talked about the framework of our government. And I would make the point, in fact, that the framework of our government as it was developed uh, uh, more than two centuries ago uh, is actually, over the last 107 days, performing masterfully. We have a uh, system of checks and balances and a separation of powers, and we've seen the United States Congress, even one of the same party as the president, not necessarily automatically agreeing with him on his top policy priorities, and you see the branch, uh, uh, the judicial branch, the courts, pushing back at him very forcefully on another one of his policy priorities. And you see not just horizontally, but vertically, a separation of powers in the form of federalism working exactly the way our founders intended it to. I made a joke earlier about California and Texas, but that's the way they wanted this. So a governor or a mayor or a legislator or a council person of either party who disagreed with the president, not only had the right to speak out, but had a means at their disposal to push back. And for those of you who in California who are cheering Kevin DeLeon, I guarantee there were Texans eight years ago who were cheering Governor Abbott just as, uh, as strongly and just as strenuously once again as is intended. So I just wanted to take a moment before we go back to the broader point and say that whether you happen to be a supporter of President Trump or not, what I take more than anything else from the last 107 days is that somehow or other, a group of really smart people from over two centuries ago came with the, up with a system that actually has helped us through some very challenging times and will continue, and will continue to do so. Yeah. Johanna. Well, I told you that was cathartic. I know. <laughs> well, and I, I actually was going to um, ask you to help me with some stats, Dan, because we were talking about this last night. Um, you know, it, 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 everything evolves, right? The pendulum swings. Um, we saw that nothing is forever, and the permanent majority turned out to be not so permanent. So I think the millennial statistics that you were bringing up last night about um, unaffiliated uh, millennials um, were pretty stark. Was it? What were the numbers? Was it 30 yeah. here in Here in California, uh, roughly 25% of the electorate, myself included, are registered as no party preference voters. And among the millennial generation, as uh, Johanna was speaki is speaking to, that figure is actually just over one third. One out of every three millennial voters is consciously and specifically registered to vote, but not as a member of one of the two major parties. Mm -hmm. And when you move from formal registration to self-identification, at the national level, between 40 and 45 percent of that generation calls themselves independent. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. This is, a, you know, many of us grew up in a world with three television networks mm -hmm. and five buttons on the car radio and two political parties. 
This generation has had an unlimited number of information entertainment choices available to it throughout their entire lives. Why would they limit themselves to a binary choice when it comes to politics? The answer is they probably won't. Right. And I think to that point, you know, that's the interesting thing. When you actually talk to that generation that will be living through, you know, clean technology jobs, for example, you know, the growth in that industry is pretty rapid. A lot of people um, are very interested in these kinds of new clean technology, getting uh, reformatting grids, electric grids, things like that. You, when you have discussions like that with people, um, it's not so party specific. Um, you know, they, for the most part, when you're talking about regulations and bringing back coal, of that age, they're probably like, why? So, you know, this is the whole, I think there's, um, there's a lot that has to change in our party system and in our representatives, and I think some of it'll change. You know, media dynamics are another thing that plays into this that we discussed last night in the sense of, you know, whatever sells um, is what's, uh, you know, what's, what's taking our... Um, our uh, bandwidth right now, I guess. So, you know, in the sense that there used to be the yellow journalism and like people on the side, you know, saying, uh, buy this newspaper, here's this headline, this is what we're doing now in this internet age. Um, we, you know, are trying to fight for all of the various, um, the various advertisers and for the various uh, money share for the subscribers, for everything. And so the, the, the model um, for our journalism entities, I think, needs to change to allow um, our democracy uh, really to thrive because I, um, I guess, you know, I so agreed with you when you were talking the last time, and this time I, I so respect what, what you were saying, but I don't, I'm the optimist, and I don't want to ever see um, our democracy die because I have traveled, I'm so very lucky, no, I know it's not, but I, I traveled to 40 countries with President Obama and um, more without. And it was always an extraordinary opportunity to see how privileged we are in America. And so to the extent that I would fight for this country and for you know, a representative democracy, and I know it's tweaks and balances is what you're saying, but I will fight for that you know, more than anything else. So. Joanna, thank you. Claudia, I'm going to I'm going to take the question on democracy, and it, we've got a question along these lines anyway. And so I'm going to I'm going to put this to you, less as a journalist, but simply as a citizen. Um, you've covered these protests you've talked about in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. protests from the left, counter protests from the right, mm -hmm. very provocative speakers from both sides. Is that kind of public, for lack of a better term, public unrest? Is that good for democracy or is it bad for democracy? Well, I, I guess my initial response will be it's, it's good for democracy. Yeah. It's, uh, everybody wants to, um, you know, we value free speech in this country a lot. Yeah. And uh, we want to make sure that voices are heard and not mu nobody wants to be muffled. <laughs> um, we just don't want to see violence. Nobody wants to see the violence. That's where you have to draw the line. But I, I think that, but you know, you have some people who say, well, we won't be heard without the violence, or maybe they're just finding fun in that, under cover of chaos, causing disruption. Uh, but I think um, the, this, this battle over free speech is something that we're going to be paying a lot of attention to uh, in the next um, four or eight years, well, forever, I suppose. But um, no, I, I think that. Uh, that it's, that it's good. I'm not sure if I'm answering the No, no, abs absolutely. And I think we'd all agree here that as long as those public expressions remain nonviolent, going back to a point that CJ was making earlier, this reflects a growing level of interest and potential involvement in the process, which can be to the good. Now, to Mike's point, that kind of unrest, generally, it, very few people protest in favor of compromise. So I, 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 see, I see your point, Mike. But there's no question that this election has led, in its aftermath, has led to a higher level of public interest and engagement in the political process than we've seen in, 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 in a lot of time. Seema, let me, let me ask you this. So you, you cover the politicians of both parties dealing with this newly engaged and newly energized and very polarized electorate. Do they understand it? 
I don't know if they understand it, but I think they want to take advantage of it or its power as best they can. And I think, um, I, th I feel like I've spoken to more Democrats about this than Republicans recently. Um, I remember like in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of the swearing in, you know, there was the Women's March, and I talked to some people who worked for Hillary Clinton's campaign who were like, if, you were, if these people were not out there knocking on doors and making phone calls in November, or I'm sorry, in October, you, know, you have no business being out there protesting today. So there was like a level of anger, like why didn't you show up for us? Um, now, I think the question is how sustainable is this? And I think this is a question, I feel like this is a question I've been asking every week, because every week there is a new protest, whether it's the Women's March, the tax protest, the uh, science march, the climate change march. I mean, I've, I've lost track of the marches. Um, is this sustainable for the next two years or the next four years on the left? If it is, will, this, will, will Democrats be able to take this energy and use it to, you know, to win back control of the Senate, possibly even win back control of the House? You know, will this make a difference in the midterm elections? Or is this going to flame out at some point? I mean, you know, it's... I mean, it's, I think it's good on both sides of the aisle to see people involved in the political process because it's important for democracy. But people, you know, you have families and jobs and lives, and you know, at some point, does this take a back seat? You know, do people stop protesting? So, um, one of the stories that I'm really interested in following for the next year and a half, like through the midterms, is to see whether this level of passion continues. And so, CJ, I want to ask you a, a, a follow-up on that. It goes back to the point we were discussing earlier about Trump's approach to the electorate prioritizing not the expansion of his base, but rather the motivation and mobilization of it. Sure. If you're Donald Trump, do you like the protests? Um, I don't think that they bother you as much as he would let on. I th so uh, here's the thing with, with President Trump and my experience covering him. He create, uh, I mean, he's very interested in adulation and positive coverage and being viewed as a um, successful president and a good leader, um, but he's, as a lot of our panelists have hit on really savvy communicator. And I think that he doesn't mind a contrast shot where there's, um, you know, liberals look chaotic or, or anti-government protesters look chaotic and they're violent and they're doing things that really, um, you know, aren't in keeping with, you know, kind of the principled protest practices of American history. I, I, I'm not saying that he wants, you know, someone in Berkeley to smash a car, um, but like, I don't think that that, I, I don't think that that probably bothers him as a contrast shot. Seema? Look, going back to, um, I don't know if you remember the, uh, the Trump appearance in San Jose, there was a very violent protest. There was a woman that was egged. There were some people that were beaten up. And um, I, I think his campaign and his supporters in California did point to this to say, hey, look at how intolerant the left is. You know, like the, the California uh, Republican Party brought the woman that was egged to the, she was their special guest at the Republican National Convention. Um, so they did and sort of point to this that they, they I don't want to say they took pride in this, but they, they did use those images um, and the storyline of what happened there to to buoy their you know their their message. Right. I mean, there's a there's a political point for President Trump to make here, right? He if if people who oppose him look unreasonable or like they're going to egg a woman who who's just going out and doing her sweet duty, that um, that just that that sort of suits his message. I mean, that proves his point in a lot of ways. And, and, and I will say that, as, as Tom mentioned in his introduction, his very gracious introduction of me, uh, my wife Cecile and I do teach a class once, uh, one semester a year at the University of California, Berkeley. Most of our students, as you might suspect, are not supporters of Donald Trump. Um, very, very few of them think that the best way to express that disapproval is by breaking windows um, and burning cars. And so we are talking, in fairness, about a very, very, very small slice of the electorate uh, the kind of people we've had the great privilege to teach understand and the point we tried to make to them is that when you are upset about the outcome of the election, the most effective thing you can do is begin work right away to prepare to elect someone who's more to your satisfaction. And the best and brightest of our students are already doing just that for 2018 and 2020 on both sides of the aisle. Mike, I'm going to give you the last word on this, um, not because I mean, all, all five of you deserve a great deal more time here. If it were up to me, we'd stay till breakfast, but that's not going to go over too well. Um, and because I, but because I picked on you a little bit earlier. Um, your, I think, reframing of your very provocative point, I think, was a really important one. You said, essentially, that democracy is going to have to adapt. Can you take a minute or so to talk about the kind of adapting that's going to be necessary for those who want to see it succeed? 
Yeah, let me be very specific too. And, and I think to show you how great a, a communicator Mr. Schnur is, I think he recharacterized my recharacterization. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the United States Constitution, the document that Dan was referring to, has actually been amended 27 times. Most of them, I would argue almost all of them, have been very positive in nature to adapt to things like allowing slaves to be freed, allowing women the enfranchisements, to lowering the voting age. All of them, almost all of them, focus on giving us greater liberties and greater interaction with our government. Those are all adaptions. They are not, by the way, democracy as we knew it, That which was the question. Democracy as we knew it back in the late 1700s said only white male property owners could vote. I think we should have changed from that. Okay, I applaud that. That's all I'm suggesting is there needs to be a greater enfranchisement, and I'm not convinced that people feel that they're being heard in a society where we have as much information that Seema was referring to earlier or that it's being manipulated, as CJ was pointing out, maybe not in those terms, but by the current president, chief executive uh, in the White House. I think we all have, it's incumbent on all of us to rethink the structures so that democracy can continue and thrive. Some of my ideas, and I'm not, not stuck on these, but I think we ought to have smaller districts that are more representative for more people, okay? I do, I think we need to start uh, fostering greater uh, citizen initiative involvement by the states. Incidentally, I believe we're, we're entering an era where there's gonna be a lot more state action on federal issues. I mean, look at California, right? Um, we, we, if we don't agree with the federal government, we just don't do it. Gay marriage, we're not gonna do it. Medical marijuana or legalization of marijuana, we're not gonna do it. Uh, sanctuary cities, we're just not gonna do it. I think that's, that's a healthy part of the discussion. I will say, I think it exacerbates to the previous question I don't know if the protests helped Donald Trump, but I know California helps Donald Trump in the same way Texas was helping Barack Obama. Because when you have this bubble of people just, this, just, just bubble of people talking to each other, you come up with these crazy ideas like, hey, let's write a bill that allows, or requires every elementary school kid to pack a pistol going into class so that we're all safe, right? That, that's lunacy. And that's where you, you go to Sacramento. I mean, we're getting there, folks. It's only been 107 days. Legislature's still in session. Just got going, right? There, these ideas, when, when you start to see this intensity, starts to manifest itself. And so I am concerned. I'm not saying the system doesn't work. I'm saying the system does work exactly the way it was designed to work. But it was designed a couple hundred years ago. And we can adjust, and we should adjust. And if a democracy is going to go on, it's an obligation for all of us to come up with ways to make greater enfranchisement possible. Bravo. I was just going to add that those things I'll fight alongside with you for okay. democracy. So <laughs> there we go. So even when our two partisans decide that uh, the, the, the can agree on a broader overriding principle like that, um, I think that sends a very important message. And of course, I think what's worth for all of us uh, to reflect on is that while Mike talks, I think, appropriately about structural and sometimes constitutional changes, the biggest change, and each one of our panelists talked about it in a somewhat different way, is a more personal, is a, is a more personal one. And whether it's through voting, whether it's through protesting peacefully, whether it's through, through engaging in social media, or whether it's coming to Ojai Chautauqua, to me that interest that level of engagement, that level of motivation to participate, to make your city, your state, your country, your community a better place is ultimately, I think, the kind of change that Mike is talking about. And inarguably, it's a much more difficult challenge in a much larger and in a much more diverse society. And I give him a lot of credit for framing it the way he did. When we started discussions about this series, we began by talking about doing a program on education. And ironically enough, nearing the conclusion of a conversation today about politics, I think what we find is ultimately the solution beyond redistricting, between, beyond changes in social media, is an electorate that is educated in many, many different ways, but in particular educated from a very young age about the importance of participating in the process. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but as I think you know, the overwhelming majority of California high schools require their students to take only one single semester of civics education before graduating. And in most of those cases, it's actually 15 weeks 
of civics and American government and geography all crammed together into 11th or 12th grade. And of course, the message we are sending, unintentionally, I, I think, to our next generation of leaders is that this politics stuff, this government stuff, this democracy stuff is so unimportant that we're not going to bother teaching it to you for your first 10 years of school. Then we're gonna shove it down your throat in one semester and then we're going to expect you to turn around 18 months later and be a regular voter and a responsible citizen. And maybe that's not the best way for us to prepare our next leaders for the responsibilities and challenges of leadership. And so that's why I'm particularly impressed by the high school students who are here with us today because they understand to their credit that class assignments are the foundation of, but not the sum total of an education. And the fact that they're taking time out of their Saturdays to be here for this conversation is something for which they deserve yet another round of applause. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to join me in thanking our panelists and giving them the kind of applause that I knew you'd want to give them uh, just about two hours ago. Um, but before I do, I think it's worth a reminder that while there have been many people involved in the successful development of this program series, there are a few in particular that deserve a great deal of credit. I mentioned them earlier, Tom and Esther Wachtel, and of course, Catherine and Tom Kraus. And Tom is gonna join us here at the podium once again. So Tom, please join us and let's thank our friend Tom Kraus for everything he's done for us. What a terrific panel. What a terrific uh, conversation. I, really. I, I would turn on my television and go to network news if I could hear a conversation like that one. I, I mean, I really would. I really would. I, I would sit through commercials <laughs> to listen to it. And I say that partly jokingly, and, but sincerely, and partly just to suggest that th this is the thing that I believe our population in the, in the country want to hear. This is the thing that they're interested in. Um, so a couple of very quick uh, announcements. There is another panel on June the 3rd. It's on media uh, and, uh, and society and politics. Uh, every one of these panels so far has gone right to the media in various ways. And so it's, it seems just like a natural progression that we take that issue on directly in and of itself. We're gonna do that on June the 3rd. Uh, please join us. If you want to get our mailings, uh, ohichat.org is the uh, place to go. Uh, if you, um, also, you can just give us your email address and we'll put you on our mail list. Uh, if you enjoyed this evening, this afternoon, if you thought it was beneficial, uh, send us some money. <laughs> we, uh, we, it costs money to put these programs on. We charge, but we don't make as much as it costs by quite a bit. And we don't have outside sponsors, not that we wouldn't uh, take money from an outside sponsor if someone came along with no strings, but we don't. So you can contribute financially, you can also contribute by helping us get things organized and attract people and get the word out and all that sort of thing. So uh, let us know if you are interested in doing that. We welcome uh, your involvement. And Dan, what a wonderful job. It's just really a thrill. <laughs> So before we, uh, before we leave, we have two final orders of business. One is just uh, a couple more thank yous. Um, please join me with all the enthusiasm you can muster in thanking Andy Gilman and his incredible team for all the hard work they do to make these things such a success. And although she hates it once again when I do this, please join me in thanking my wife, Cecile, because while I get the microphone, she does all the work to make these programs work the way they do. And before, uh, before I ask you to thank our panelists, um, I'm going to ask, let's see, I think I, I told you earlier that two of our panelists were married. Um, we got one guess that uh, well, was, was incorrect. And so what I'm gonna do, like they used to do on, if you remember the old TV show, um, What's My Line? I'm gonna ask the, the, the married couple on our panel to please stand. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so
CJ Jackson and Johanna Masca, thank you very much. Mike Madrid, C. Mameda, Claudia Cowan, what a phenomenal conversation. Thanks so much to all of you. Can't tell you how grateful we are to you. And finally, once again, thanks to all of you. Without the good people of Chautauqua deciding that they wanted to have this kind of conversation, they wouldn't take place. You've set a tremendous example, and we're so grateful to you for letting us join us. Once again, give yourselves a round of applause. Have a great night.